claviceps lazarus. Day zero. Scott, my boyfriend of three months, is making Thanksgiving dinner for me and my family. Scott is the best. He is the hottest, nicest, smartest, and artistic man I've ever dated. Scott is the type of guy that can get any girl, but he chose me. I would do anything for him. I used to judge other women who had tattoos, but I get it now. I have a tattoo of Scott's name over my heart. He is super smart too. He used to work in the food science industry and knows everything about food. He is going to invent his own diet and I am here for it. We met at my book club meeting, he was our waiter. I have jumped on board with Scott on his diet. It's like veganism meets the clean diet with a focus on superfoods. Scott looks like a marble chiseled Roman god, so I trust him. He put me on the weight loss track while he is on the muscle gain track. I feel great, I've already lost 10 pounds. The look on my mother's face mirrors my older sister's. My perfect sister, Mara has to add insult to injury by poking at the meat substitute that Scott has invented. The gray mass jiggles slightly. This looks so good, Mara says sarcastically. I kicked her under the table, and she lets out a giggle. Scott graciously serves all of us. I take a heaping fork full of gray mass and put it in my mouth. Eat, Scott urges my mother and sister. I am so embarrassed. I don't want Scott to think I'm as closed-minded as my mother and sister, so I shovel the rest of the gray mass on my plate into my mouth. Whoa, slow down Bessie, Scott jeers. Compliments to the chef, I say, making sure I'm peppy. That's it for you. You're close to your daily nutrient intake, Scott says flatly. Mother and Mara glare disapprovingly at me then at each other. They both want to say something smart, and I silently pray they both keep their mouths shut. Scott doesn't look happy as he scrapes Mother and Mara's plates clean. They rudely left everything untouched. They're just not as cultured, Scott. We grew up poor, I coo, hoping to tamp down some of the resentment on his face. Well, I'm just glad you liked it, he says, then meets my eyes with a smile. I'm proud of you, for stopping when I told you to stop eating. You're on your way to reaching your max health. I smile and I am overjoyed. I've made Scott proud. Day 1 I feel like I'm drowning. I wake with a start and quickly get out of bed. I do not want to be the one who ruins Scott's organic handwoven silk sheets, dyed with organic turmeric. The moment I stand up, the liquid running down the back of my throat shifts forward and starts tickling my nostrils before oozing down my face. I make a note to myself, get Scott's apartment a humidifier. I turn on the lights and immediately wash my face and my hands. The cool water spirals down the sink, tinted a gradient pink. My nostrils twinge as I try to hold back a sneeze. A forceful sneeze escapes and so does something viscous, so thick it is nearly solid. I reach up and something is hanging from my left nostril, something wet and semi-solid. I don't know why I have the urge to give the tendril a tug, but I do and as it slithers out, dropping with a wet plunk in the white sink. I feel so much relief in my sinuses, eyes, and stomach. The pressure in my head that woke me subsides. My nosebleed slows to nothing more than a drop here and there. I wash and dry my face and head back to bed. Sarah's blonde head pops over the low cubicle wall that separates us. Bess, you don't look good. Maybe you should go home, Sarah says. I'm fine. It's Friday and I can make it to the end. It's only 6 hours and 15 minutes to, I reply. How was your Thanksgiving? Sarah asks. 
I can't help but smile because I now have something to brag about. Scott made an entire vegan and superfoods dinner. It was really good, I lie, especially to Sarah. Wow, you're so lucky. I wish Ivan and I would have stayed home for Thanksgiving. We went to several neighborhood tailgates. I am wiped out, Sarah says. Day 2 I couldn't sleep last night, and the sun is coming up over the horizon. Last night I started getting this massive pounding at the back of my head and it hasn't subsided. You should probably call in sick, Scott says, a tray in hand. I do as I'm told, and my supervisor wishes me a speedy recovery. I consider asking Scott if he is going to work, but not wanting to be seen as a crazy girlfriend, I bite my tongue. Scott hands me a saucer with a piece of leftover gray aspic. I don't want to eat it. It's not the flavor, but the texture. It's a cross between jello and maybe a soft flavorless pear? Scott smiles and I take a bite of the gray matter. He hands me a cup of coffee alternative which he says is way healthier than real coffee. I down the small teacup of his coffee alternative in one gulp, hoping it bypasses my taste buds. It doesn't. It is thick, coating my mouth in a tannic film. It takes everything in me to not grimace. Good girl, Scott says, his baby blue eyes glimmering at me. I force a smile and sink back into bed. For a moment, I feel better. I watch Scott's back turn the corner and a wave of relief washes over me. I don't know if it is because I don't want Scott to see me as weak, or if it is something else. Maybe privacy to reconsider my relationship. Sleep takes over and everything bothering me seems to slip away. I slip into that strange place between sleep and waking, a nearly transparent network of filaments spread across the back of my eyelids. The last thing on my mind is not Scott, but my mother. Day 3 my alarm goes off. Why did I think a fire alarm was a funny sound for my morning alarm? It is so hard to open my eyes. My headache is somehow worse than it was yesterday. I cradle my head, burying my face in the pillow to block out the weak stream of sunlight peeking through the blinds. All I want right now is my mom. How stupid is that? When I finally manage to make my way out of bed and into the bathroom, I know I'm more than late for work. I know I should be moved faster than this, but I am finding it hard to hold on to anything. My hands tremble and so do my legs. My hands shake and refuse to cooperate as I reach for my toothbrush. I have no choice but to give up. I duck my head under the faucet, letting the cold water run over my fiery skin. Then I stand upright and look at my reflection in the mirror. I look like shit. My hair is knotted, my skin sallow, my veins, capillaries, and arteries working so hard they're not only visible but easily traceable under my skin. My eyes are discharging a thick green mucus. Perfect, exactly what I want to add to my current list of problems, an eye infection. Instead of trying to get to work three hours late, I fall back into bed. I can't shake the need to have my mom around. I know it is because I'm sick, but damn, I should call her. I cradle my head once more and pray for sleep to take me. It is dark outside my window. I've slept the day away. I'm probably fired, but I don't care. I do not feel good. Maybe I should go to the emergency room. My copay is probably going to put me into debt, but I think I need help. Scott, I call out, but my voice is nothing more than a hoarse whisper. I reach across the bed for my phone on my nightstand to find nothing. Where the hell is my phone? I am 90% sure that I plugged it in last night. 
I force myself out of bed in search of my phone. My apartment door looks inconspicuous to an outsider but having looked at that exact door for the past four years, it is unlocked. Even from where I stand, I can hear soft murmurings on the other side. I step up to the door and peek through the peephole, straining my ears to listen. There is a woman with raven black hair, her small frame hidden under a camel trench coat standing too close to Scott. Scott, you can't do this, it's unethical. If you don't stop, I'll have no choice but to report you to the authorities, the woman says coolly. And if you tell on me, you'll lose out on all the money you've invested. Hell, you might go to prison too, Scott fires back. I don't care about the damn money, Scott, she says. What about the hours, days, months, weeks? I don't care. What you're doing is wrong, she hisses, invading his personal space. Scott looks livid. He is tense, his jaw clenched. The woman hangs her head and shakes it. You've gone over to the dark side, she mutters. Scott cups her chin and forces her to look at him. I feel anger rise from the pit of my stomach, daring Scott to do it in my mind and also praying he won't. She jerks her head back and bats his hand away from her chin. Shut it down, Scott, she demands, then brushes past him and quickly strides down the hallway. I force myself to turn away from the door before Scott catches me. Day 4 I can't focus on my job because the thought of Scott in love with a strange woman troubles me. Then there is also the big secret. What in the world were they talking about? On top of my occupied mind, the persistent headache has dulled a bit but now my limbs shake uncontrollably, and I keep falling asleep. I wake up on my back in a bed in a sterile room that smells of disinfectant and latex. A muffled voice comes from somewhere above. I can't make out what it says or even if it is human. Perhaps I was abducted by aliens? The last thing I remember is staring at my computer screen and my office phone. A sharp hiss and mechanical wheeze announce the arrival of someone or something. A white bubble suit comes into view and hovers above me. It takes me a moment to realize there is a person inside the suit. The face of a kind middle-aged woman looks back at me. Hi Bessie, I'm your nurse, Caroline. How are you feeling? Her voice crackles a bit followed by an electronic click as the microphone inside her suit ceases transmission. What's going on? I ask. Caroline's face wrinkles around the eyes as she tilts her head sympathetically. You are sick, and you passed out at work. You are in the hospital in a quarantine room. We aren't sure what is going on, but this is just a safety procedure until we figure out what is making you sick, Caroline says. A sinking feeling seemingly drags down all my vital organs into an invisible sinkhole. Another white bubble suit enters the room and begins explaining the results of my tests. All I can focus on are the images of my own body scrolling across the smart board. My body is a series of black, white, and gray images with networks of white filaments spidering all over. Fungal infection and ergotism reach my ears. I don't understand. Moments after the medical staff cleared out, two menacing figures stepped through the automatic doors. One was a head shorter than the other and slightly more graceful. They settled on either side of me at the foot of my bed, the shorter man on my left and the other on my right. Both men look grim and serious even though the shorter one offers a smile. My name Agent Blake, this is my partner, Agent Smith. We'd like to ask you a few questions, is that okay? The shorter man asks. I nod. How long have you known Scott McAllister? The shorter agent asked. I shrug, 
silently doing the math. Three months or so, I answer. What do you know about Mr. McAllister, he asks. I begin mauling over his question. What did I know about Scott? In truth, not much. I know he is a waiter, a musician, an inventor, but not much else apparently. In fact, he had introduced himself as Scott James, not McAllister. Not much I guess, I answer. Both men shift in their seats, the shorter man leaning forward in his seat. Miss, I hate to break it to you, but Scott McAllister is a disgraced microbiologist. He was fired from his last job as a researcher for ethics violations. He engineered things that could be used as biological weapons, he said. What does that have to do with me? I ask. We believe he might have been giving you an engineered strain of fungus. Do you know what ergot is? I shake my head. Ergot is a fungus that normally infects cereal grains, most commonly rye. It causes hallucinations and sometimes death. The shorter man slid a phone across my bed. On it was a photo of the woman I'd seen the previous day talking to Scott in the hallway. The agent swiped a gloved finger across the screen and the next photo made my jaw drop in horror. There was a stem of sorts sprouting from the top of a dark head. I could only tell it was a human head because of the hair. The rest of their words melt into one chaotic buzz inside my head. I was right, Scott was a genius. He had engineered a strain of ergot fungus to take over the human neurological system. All those white filaments on my scans were fungal mycelium, fungal networks wrapping themselves around my spine, taking over control of my body. I am doomed to die, just like the woman I'd seen in the hallway. Once I am dead, the fungus will take over complete control of me and make me climb to a high point before erupting from my skull to spread its spores. I was a pawn in Scott's sick game. He never loved me. Even his former partner, the woman in the hallway, whom he had loved dearly, had been poisoned and died. There was no cure. Antifungal medicine was useless against this strain of ergot. I had loved Scott with all my being. I had become whoever he wanted me to be. After I'd signed my body over to research and accepted my death, I worked up the courage to look through the pictures of the woman in the hallway. Her beautiful face was twisted into a look of pain, her blank white eyes stretched wide, her mouth open and her jawbone straining at the skin. Her hands were wrapped around a tree limb so tight her knuckles were white. The stem that cracked her skull open was a mushroom, or as the smart people referred to it as the reproductive organ. It was a cream color and porous, just a single furry stalk growing from her head. I don't know how long she'd been dead but already, but a white furry growth sprouted across her face and out of every opening. I am angry, sad, and all around confused. Why did this happen to me? I had truly believed Scott loved me. The last thing on my mind is my mom. Will she and my sister me okay, or are they doomed like me? If you enjoy this content, please remember to like, comment, subscribe, and share with someone who might enjoy this too. Thank you all for taking time out of your day for Poppy's Storytime.